the thing I wanted to chat with you about was uh, was enterprise software because you know I, I, I you taught me a lot about it. You know I came I came into uh, into Apigee when we met. You know with very strong opinions about uh, software and, and open source and you know uh, there being a right way to kind of build companies that sell software. And I was I was wrong about most of these things I can say. And um, and in particular I think you know I was very wrong as a lot of uh, people coming from an engineering background can be thinking about like. Uh, the markets for, for software and in the past few years it seemed like there's been a lot of movement uh, it has always been a lot of enterprise software company but it seems like there's more and more um, of them now and more and more play that are kind of really revolve around enterprise pricing of software and, and enterprise plays and I, I don't know if it's me just kind of being more aware of it but if you also feel like it's it's been a trend actually right that that people have been shifting towards enterprise software well no I mean I think that um it goes through investment waves. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the interesting thing about enterprise software uh, has been that, you know, it's really been a 20-year thing, which right. is that, that companies have been going and having to, by necessity, go and uh, adopt, you know, internet technologies. Right. Um, for uh, for their businesses, right. and so you know, and there's been different waves of it. I'm, you know, uh, way back in the day, every company needed to go and have an e-commerce site, or uh, you know, so so everybody went and bought all the app servers, and companies like BEA that some people may remember, um, you know, did a lot of uh, uh, business in in helping people, you know get their applications online or their e-commerce sites and you know my company epicentric when everybody wanted to go and have a web portal you know they they came and bought software from us and you had people like vignette going and getting with content management right. and all of that but that's because the, the the companies have always had to catch up that's one aspect right. of it that's infrastructure oh, that makes sense yeah and then you had a lot of other stuff like the productivity software coming online and people going and buying the the collaboration software and Microsoft with SharePoint and all of that um, but but a bunch of other companies and that modern day equivalent of that is literally just boxes right uh, you know and Dropbox to a certain extent but box is just you know the latest iteration of collaboration software right so you know there and and um, and we have all of the the database companies and right. you know going and, and doing replacements so there's this constant wave of, of enterprises companies need to go and buy software and so if you're a, if you're a startup and you're trying to figure out you know what uh, you know where where is there going to be a, a, a way that you can go and you know solve a problem you know the enterprise market is always really interesting I think you know what's been really fascinating to watch has been uh, kind of the different types of experimentation that's happened around how you sell to enterprise and as right. far as I'm concerned actually that's been the only interesting thing to watch right you're, you're correct right because it's kind of like it feels like we're, we're, we're seeing more and more enterprise plays because you know like people are still kind of coming off the internet wave and the mobile wave and the cloud wave and, and kind of just to everything kind of uh, that the companies have to catch up to, but but the one thing that's really been changing is like the sales models and distribution models in general, right? Of like how people package that software. Maybe that's why we're seeing more and more activity. And so, I mean, very noticeably, there's been like I guess the SaaS wave, right? Where people were like doing this kind of uh, subscription pricing. But like, what, what else have you seen that's kind of very interesting? Well, so I think that the thing, you know, the biggest thing that. It, that's changed obviously has been the SaaS play and and that's I think we all understand that pretty well um, at least the basics of it right. I think what what people don't fully appreciate has been so you know I think most startups are really good at understanding kind of the uh, the first order um, uh, economics of, uh, of, of SaaS. What they don't understand is how to get scale out of it. Right. You know, it's really funny, one of my colleagues from Six Apart, uh, Michael Sippy, who went on to uh, run product at Twitter, um, he did a, uh, he was on a panel at South by Southwest, and uh, you know, this was, uh, this was after, I think, whatever the big, uh, 
you know, the, the, the big collapse in, in 2008 or whatever, you know, the, uh, you know, somebody asked the question of what are the skills you need to know, you know, to prepare yourself. Right. Like, what should I learn? Should I be learning uh, Ruby? What, you know, right. his comment was, you should be learning Excel. <laughs> yes. And uh, everybody laughed, but uh, he was dead right. Yeah. And um, especially when I look at companies focusing on uh, on developer uh, developer startups, open source startups, I always think that in the back of my mind. Yes, you, should when, like you should have learned Excel. Yeah. Um, I, you know, when I, when I when I see like when I see you know, I'm not going to name names, but when I go and see like blog posts about like the open source business model, how it doesn't work, and I'm like, you know what? There's a guy that didn't learn Excel. Right. Because the reality is is that you look at the companies for whom open source business models are working, they just did the math. Right. And um, and that was actually the most interesting lesson I learned many years ago in the enterprise space was that you actually, um, your price was like the last thing that you figured out. Like you just, you know, you could just backwards derive what your price needed to be from what it was gonna take for your business to work. Right. And the companies that did the reverse of that, that went and said, oh, I think my software should be worth this much, and then what, and then sort of tried to take it from there, they ended up always in the situation where the, the economics didn't work. The right. unit economics of what they were charging for did not scale up to actually build a business. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I guess, you know, I see what you mean. It's just like, uh, the, the big kind of complicated part of it is like, um, is finding that, right? It seems like, you know, there's this like high, high price point type of sales model, uh, you know, like, you know, the, the whole suits kind of knocking at your door type of sales model that people commonly associate with enterprise sales. And then it goes all the way to this like, um, you know, box like model where you do, you're selling like a lot of seats on a subscription model and, uh, and everything in between, like what GitHub, I guess, and GitLab are trying to do which is kind of somewhat somewhat different as well. Well, I mean, I think the you know GitHub and GitLab and so on. Those those are collaboration companies. Right. Um, I, we've, you and I have had this conversation before. They they have more in common with SharePoint than they do with um, and same. I'd throw Atlassian in there. Uh, things like Jira and so on. They're more in common with Office 365 right. than they do with. Uh, developer technology. Right. Yeah, it's and really about sharing kind of data in the company. Exactly. Yeah. You can think of them basically as as you know, uh, collaboration software targeted at the developer vertical. Right. And and in fact, when you look at things like Jira and so on, they've expanded into project management beyond right. beyond that, just that. Um, but those are very different dynamics. Right. And in fact, you know, Atlassian does a really good job of making that model work because. They, in many ways, um, emulate the way that Salesforce works. Right. In that, that you start thinking about, okay, you know, what's my cost of acquiring a user? How do I go and basically colonize a company in terms of number of seats? Right. Once I have that, how do I then roll out incremental applications right. per user? Because you've got to have to have a growth model. Right, right, right. You know, and this is one of those things that we always forget. And I, I, you know. No matter how many times I've lived through this, I always, you know, it, it always sort of strikes me as like this new discovery that it's like, wow, you know what? Selling more stuff to your existing customers is a hell of a lot easier. That's where your growth happens rather than right. having to go yeah. and, 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 you know. But a lot of people don't get people. that. I mean, I was just talking to a company, like a very famous company last week that, you know, was rolling out a bunch of features and had like, you know, specific plans to like give them for free to new users and enterprise users and not charge for them. And it seems like that's a, that's, that's a, a mistake, right? That like a lot of people still well, seem to Well, you've got to be, be growing on all axes. I mean, on the converse of things is you've got, you know, the classic dilemma of an enterprise company that has its you know, 100 big customers that it, you know, bends over backwards for and keeps happy and never actually reaches the larger market. Right. Um, so, you know, don't interpret it, you know, don't interpret what I'm saying to be right. the, the the idea that you should not be focusing on, right. on you know, getting new people on uh, onto your stuff. But, but, you know, I do think that when you get to that point of, um, you also have to be thinking about how do you actually sort of increase the number of, of you know, services, different things that your existing customers Right, are, yeah, uh, that volume is interesting because I guess, you know, in my mind, maybe that's, that's wrong too, it's like, you know, a lot of enterprise software wasn't about volume, it was just about like big ticket items that you could sell 
to a few to the Fortune 500, right? And 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 kind of sell them um, as a big deployment, a big site-wide kind of deployment. But now it seems like a lot of it does go through volume, right? Of how many employees can you sell this to? How many features can you get each employee to buy into? And it's not just selling people databases or or ERPs or whatever. It's it's also a lot of uh, a lot of uh, almost consumer-like type of volume play in terms of the number of seats you're selling and engagement you're driving for your application. Well, you've thrown a couple of ideas out there, and so I think that one of the things you have to figure out when you say, and this is part of why enterprise, when so many startups go and throw the, the enterprise term out there as kind of this this you know magic right. umbrella, like oh no, we're not doing consumer work. You know, yeah. it's a lot more nuanced than that. Right. And then you start to get into, okay, are you applications or infrastructure? Right, right, right. And that's like the first cut. Right. And then if your applications, is is it per user based? Yeah. Um, you know, or is there some other, you know, uh, other metric, you know? And, and then if your infrastructure, you've got a whole other can of worms. Right. And we talked a little bit about yeah. that, right? We talked, we mentioned quickly like open source plays. Right. Uh, there's your straight up like closed source big license plays. You know what else do you see in that kind of on that side of the business? Because I think a lot of people are familiar with kind of at least some of the uh, current and emerging pricing models for applications. Well, I mean, but again, infrastructure it, is, when you get yeah. into infrastructure, it gets really interesting. I mean, look, this is the whole. So a lot of people go and talk about you know big data. You know, you and I have had this conversation quite a bit about big data. So um, a lot of they. Um, uh, a lot of the data that people deal with in startups, for example, or even you know a lot of these uh, large startups, large tech companies that that we go and fawn over in terms of of the data sets they work on. Um, it wasn't like you couldn't do those in Oracle. It wasn't like Oracle just right. wouldn't scale. Yeah. Um, you know, not to sound like you know an old timer, but a lot of people like uh, you know who have never actually used Oracle right. would go and, and say, uh, uh, you know, no, Oracle could have never. Yeah, of course they could have actually. Right. You know, Oracle would have found a way to do it. Um, but the thing is that the unit economics right. of big data were fundamentally different right. than than the unit economics of of um, of the way Oracle did business. So Oracle, of course, you know, um, you know, would run, uh, you know. Uh, your credit card transactions, right? right? Um, which are obviously high volume, large data sets, and so on. Um, they would, they would, uh, you know, they they would charge you an arm and a leg for that because if you think about what's the business value of a single record in that situation, like think about what would happen if I lost uh, a record that was for a credit card transaction or a deposit. I mean, that's right. actually a pretty significant thing. Right. Um, the big data databases, they had a different set of trade-offs. Right. They were like, you know, um, if I lose a single record, well, I'm, I'm using that database to log, uh, you know, uh, page hits to my website. I don't care if I lose a single record. Right. So I'm willing to go and, you, and basically make entirely different economic trade-offs for, for what database technology I'm going to use. Whereas Oracle is about like no single record ever lost. And I know this is oversimplification. There's some right. people are going to be like, you know, DBAs and stuff are going to be right. scoffing at these assertions. So, no, but no, I, I but, but, but uh, that's really what it came down to. Right. And, uh, and what Oracle found was that there was like no way that they could price for the situations where people had billions of records of which they were happy to lose, you know, 2% on versus the situations where people were like, like you know, where every record was worth this much. Right. You basically have to just sort of try to figure out what the value is right. um, and base your pricing around that. Mm -hmm. And, and it, became, it becomes very hard. And that's where the disruption opportunity is. Right. Where, where, you know, if you are doing Cassandra or you're doing MongoDB or you're doing any of the, or CouchDB, right. you're doing any of these new class of, of databases where, where the customers have different economic trade-offs and it's, it's almost, you know, impossible right. for for the incumbent in a right. different use case to go after that. Right, and I guess, you know, the, the gap, right, for people, um, you know, they're, they're like just getting started in this or want to go to an enterprise is a lack of awareness of those business objectives. You know, we think about consumer application, we're like, oh, I'm a consumer and like, I would want an app that does this or I want to, you know, a game to catch Pokemon or, you know, you right. can kind of relate to it. But, you know, really, even if you run your own company in, on some small scale, like relating to the business objective and trade-off and the economics of something like a Fortune 500 company is pretty damn hard, right? Well, so the, issue, the challenge you get into is to try to figure out, 
you know, it's like the old adage, there's only 500 companies in the Fortune 500. Right. So then you have to go and figure out, um, you know, I've seen plenty of startups over the years that go and, and have sold to some large percentage or a decent percentage, you right. know, like, oh, you know, X percentage of the Fortune 500, 30% or something. Right. And you're like, wow, that's fantastic. But what you find is that, you know, some of those are, you know, are doing fantastically well and others are, are challenged. And you're like, well, with all these great customers, what, what accounted for it? Well, the question was, what was it that they got? Did, were they in some particular little pilot project? Right. Were they in a, you know, strategic project? Were they, were they, were they, um, did they have a foothold that allowed them to actually, within it, each one of those companies, go and expand to dozens of projects? Right. Did they get to expand to thousands of seats if it was per user? Right. Like, those are the questions you have to ask. Yeah, no, and you're right. So it's the multiple layers of difficulty, right? So you, you kind of have to understand, you know, whether you're more application infrastructure, you know, what you're going to do with your technology. I mean, let's let's you go have to think and, about, yeah. Let's imagine you're, you're doing mobile. Right. You know, an area near, near and dear to your sure, heart, right? Yeah. Um, and the question now becomes like, and you're selling to the enterprise, like, is this for their consumer-facing app? Right. Um, is it for their employee-facing apps? If it's a consumer-facing app, um, you know, how many consumer apps are they are they building? Like, the reality is is that um, for any of the major brands that are part part of the Fortune 500, they have at least one, right. probably. Yeah. Some of them have. Um, uh, you know, without naming names, I, I know some of the major consumer brands have maybe um, between between their for for like different languages and different right. markets. They might have actually thirty or forty. Yeah, um, I've seen that situation with a little like hundred, but yeah, um, a couple of instances of that. It's rare. Um, in the, the, for for consumer markets, I'm talking so, about yeah, putting yeah, it in yeah, an app store. Yeah, yeah. Right. So so now you're thinking about okay, how do I price for that? Right. Right. Um, You've got to figure out, I mean, you know, you've got to basically, you know, backwards integrate it because the reality is, is that you need to be figuring out how the life, if you, if you are going after the enterprise, um, you need to make it to, to the IPO in a way, quote unquote, you know, with 500, you know, 1,500 companies that are going to, you know, some of which are going to buy your product and they all have, you know, between one to 30 apps, right? And so the math has to work that way, right? If you're, if you think your value is tied to the number of consumer applications. Again, going back to that, that question of, of, uh, of, uh, you know, doing, uh, you know, being able to do Excel. I mean, you've got to figure out a way that you're going to get. You know, ideally, you're thinking, you know, assuming that's your end state, but, but regardless, I mean, you're talking about scenarios that you're getting to, to 100 million a year in revenue. Right. Um, and, uh, and ideally more than that. Right. But, that, but just to be thinking about that, just to right. be at the point where you're thinking about doing an IPO. So, so again, you know, how are you getting to the point where each one of these customers is spending at least a couple of million with you per year? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, how does your $50 a month pricing model Right. Or you know, or or call us for seventy five k a year. Right. You know that we see on all these developer websites. Sure. How does that get that? You know, for enterprise, you know, how does that add up? Right. It doesn't for a lot of them, and that's where they dig themselves into the problem. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So so again, that's where I go back to you know. Uh, so then you back out of it, and you're going to say, okay, well, that means I need X amount of projects. Right. Right. Okay. Um, and and. You know, how are you going to get to those multiple projects? And no, so, yeah, so, yeah. And we talked about it. It's either you know, more seats, you know, if you're seeing those employees, or more features, or you have someone to cross sell or upsell, and, and, or just, you know, just have a higher. And one of the things we did at, at Apogee that I thought was, was awesome was just, you know, driving up the, the, the average contract value, right? Just, you know, just having this constant push to try to get, you know, more value out of the product that we add, right? And get more, more dollars out of that. Well, I think, I think you know, um, I think you see, will see for any company that's successfully executing on the enterprise and I think this is the thing that over the years I know you know you and I've had this conversation we've seen it looking at, at plenty of companies the ones that that make it work um, uh, have figured out how to do it right. and um, uh, you know uh, the ones that have you know have gone in and embraced this completely you know friendly self-serve pricing that translates into you know, 20, 50K a year, but for companies of, of that size, right. it, the math doesn't end up working. Yeah, it's really tough. It's really tough. Cool. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Yeah.